Welcome to 2025 MRAP subscribers. Uh, I know it's the sixth and we're a couple of days after New Year, but this is our first episode of the year. Jan, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Our first whole year of weekly that we're entering here. We started back in 2024. Very exciting. It's good to see you. It's good to see you too. Hopefully you had a nice New Year's, uh, not working. I, I was actually at work and um, I'm going to save those stories for another time. Oh, but they're good stories. They always are around New Year's. Always the best. I worked on New Year's Eve day. Um, okay. I didn't uh, enjoy the night shift, I guess, but you know you know what I mean. The night shift on enjoy New Year's Eve? Definitely in air quotes. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jen, I have a case that was not from New Year's, but it was a, a pretty interesting case. I'm going to throw it by you and see what you do with it. Hopefully a little bit better than we did with it initially, but I think there's some interesting things that came up here. Pretty run-of-the-mill initial presentation, 23-year-old brought in by family with a suspected overdose about 20 minutes prior to arrival, which sounds like a really short time to get to the ED, but it sounds like the patient took an overdose and then immediately regretted it, let the family know, and they drove him right into the ED. Vital signs initially looked pretty good. Heart rate was 92, BP was 110 over 70, temp was normal, SAT was 99%, respiratory rate a true 16. And so the patient gets brought into the ED, general bed for an evaluation. I go in and honestly, I'm going to admit to you right up front, I did the thing that we tell people not to do, which is I ordered a bunch of stuff before I went in the room. I ordered the psych panel because I'm like, I'm not getting out of this. There's no way that I'm going to get out of this without consulting psychiatry. And there's no way that they're going to see the patient without a whole bunch of unnecessary blood tests and urine tests. So I threw all that stuff up there, a basic metabolic, a CBC, the urine tox before I got any information. Jen, what else do you add to that in your suspected overdose? Well, if it's a suspected overdose, I'd probably add an EKG as something I would order pretty much up front. It's such an easy test to get. Could give you some clues. Certainly could be a baseline if it's a true overdose for sure. Um, and assuming that we don't know what might have been ingested, I think it's common practice to order the things that we have reversal agents for that are time sensitive. So you know, the acetaminophen level, the aspirin level, maybe toxic alcohols if there's some reason to send those. If it's a female, I'm adding on a pregnancy test pretty much up front as well. Those are, those are my thoughts on that one. Yeah, I think the aspirin and the acetaminophen are probably the biggest ones to make sure. It's nice because my set comes with that already checked off. I don't have to remember to get the acetaminophen level. And, you know, the toxicologists always say there's so many preparations with acetaminophen in there's so many drug preparations with acetaminophen in it. You just don't know. And so you're better off just getting it because we can actually do something about it. So I order all that stuff. I walk into the room and the patient looks totally fine. It sounds like it was a moment of impulsiveness, immediate regret, as we mentioned up front. Patient looks great. And the family hands me the pill bottle that the patient took. And that's when my heart drops because the medication bottle that they give me is completely empty and it says colchicine on it. And Jan... Ugh. um. I went from, I'm totally fine, this is cool, to complete panic in about 10 seconds. Yeah, I think I would have felt the same way. I mean, we all know that colchicine is a very toxic drug. And one of the reasons that we don't tend to use it very often is because of its th narrow therapeutic index, which just basically means that you can pop over to the dark side pretty quickly. Um, colchicine messes with a lot of basic cell functions, mitosis being one of them. And as soon as you hear that, you, you know one. that it's pretty much <laughs> an important cell function. So it's going to make you really sick pretty fast. Um, I mean, it can make it you pretty sick even when it's doing its job. Uh, you get GI symptoms. That's kind of part of what colchicine gives you. So if you take too much of it, you can imagine where that's going to go next. So this is not good. Yeah, this is not good. And all of the things that you just said rushed into my brain and the first thing I did was feigned calmness, left the room, and then went and asked my charge nurse <laughs> if I can please get a critical care bed. Because even though this patient looks great, they're not going to look great soon. And so we calmly walked the patient and the family over to our critical care area, got them into a bed, dropped in two lines, started some fluids, put in a call to tox. And our toxicologists call very rapidly back. So I knew that I was going to get them right away. And I asked the dad to pull up if he knew what the prescription was, like how many pills were in there, when it got filled, all that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, that bottle was full. That bottle was full Ugh. before the patient took it. So there were 90 points. 
there were 90 tabs of 0.6 milligrams. So, um, Jen, that's a pretty massive dose. Yeah, you can look up the ranges, you know, of, of where you are and what kind of symptoms you expect to get. Um, and that seems like, you know, the, the basics are some GI symptoms. We know that that's first. Then you get systemic toxicity, and then you go into cardiovascular collapse. So you'd have to do some math, which is not my strong suit. But if you do some math pretty quick, you'll realize that you are way up there. Yeah, way, way up there. And we'll have a table in the show notes with the different ranges for toxicity based on the amount that was taken. It's a milligram per kilogram kind of calculation. I didn't have to do this calculation. I knew it was a big dose. Put in the call to the toxicologist. They called back and they said, so um, this patient's going to be really sick in a bad way really soon. I'm like, yep, I know that. I'm in the critical care area. Here's what we've done. And the first question they asked me is, what do you think about doing a gastric lavage? So uh, Jan, I'm going to ask you, what do you think about doing a gastric lavage? <laughs> I am not for it. <laughs> I am. I mean, I, it's been a long time since I've had to do one. There, at this point, you know, it's something that used to be done all the time in the 70s. You know, fast forward into the 90s, it's, the toxicology society start to come out saying this is not something that we should be doing, except for very, very specific circumstances. And what you're describing to me might be those exact circumstances, you know, mm. a, a, a time that, you know, a very toxic drug. This might be one of those one of those moments. I feel like this is the classic one. This is the classic one that I was taught as a resident by the toxicologist that I trained under. You have to have a drug that you don't have an antidote to. You have to have a drug that causes significant toxicity. You have to have a dose that would cause significant toxicity. And it has to be within a relatively narrow time window. It has to be pretty soon from ingestion because after that, it's probably left the stomach and you're not going to get it out with a lavage tube. So Jan, I looked at that list of four things and I'm like, uh, I'm checking them all off. We think yeah. that this was about 30 minutes ago. Now that we've moved the patient, gotten a couple of lines and all that kind of stuff, it's within an hour. The drug is definitely super toxic. We don't have an antidote. And we do suspect that the dose that was taken is going to be really, really toxic. So I've done a couple of these. I've been involved in three in my career, which kind of just shows how rare these are. And I think that it was the right move to do. I think it was a good suggestion. So we decided to do it. I don't know, Jane, you said you don't do them very often, but do you remember the last time you did one? I mean, honestly, I have to reach back to residency. I can think of a couple times that we did it in residency. I think of it as the garden hose. Go get the garden hose. Let's go. Um, the problem with the garden hose is that as you shove down the garden hose, um, a lot of bad things can happen, right? If you have somebody who's not completely awake, they start gagging. It's a mess. So you're going to have to intubate this person, which now takes you down a whole different pathway, committing you to ICU world. But that's I think that's where this patient's going anyway. So, you know, intubating this person putting down the garden hose, starting the lavage. It's not that hard once you get it down. You know, you're just mm -hmm. lavaging and sucking it out. I mean, it's it's just the process of the decision to do it. Um, and then, you know, thinking about the airway implications. Yeah, so we knew this was definitely going to have to require an intubation prior to us dropping that tube in. There was no way we're... I mean, if you look in the books, they describe putting this thing in the nose in an awake patient. There's no way. No, no. no one's nostril is big enough to take this thing. I don't care what they say. So we were definitely going to intubate the patient put this in through the mouth. It's orogastric lavage in this case. So Correct. we had a discussion. We had a discussion with the family and with the patient. And I mean, time is of the essence here because we do have this closing window in which this can be beneficial. So we had the conversation very quickly and said, you know, this is a severely toxic drug. I have no antidote. The dose that was taken is definitely going to cause some problems. Here's one thing that we can do. It's being recommended by the toxicologist. And everybody was kind of on board with it. And again, it shows you this was not in many ways your typical overdose because the patient was like, I made a huge mistake. Go for it. Yeah. And so we decided to do an RSI and, and the patient was hemodynamically stable, Jan. So that part was actually relatively easy. We tubed the patient. We put in the orogastric lavage tube. And then I actually had the toxicologist on speakerphone just to walk us through this because it had been a while. And I don't know where the Roberts and Hedges textbook is in my ED. So I'm not going to pull that out and try to read that while we're doing the procedure. So we just had the toxicologist walk us through it on the phone. You should always know where the Roberts and Hedges textbook is, Swami. You <laughs> so know true. this. I regretted it so much that I didn't know where it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, basically, the, the, the idea of this is that you're trying to lavage those pill fragments out. So that's why you need the larger tube that you can't go with some smaller tube in the nose. 
And then you basically need to put the patient in a left lateral decubitus position. If you've ever seen someone get an EGD, it's not that different. You know, you roll them on their side. Yep. You may even want to put their head down a little bit um, to try to get the contents going in the right direction. And then you basically just start lavaging saline and sucking it out and hoping that you see some pill fragments. And if you do, then you know that what you're doing is worth it because you're getting some of that raw material out before it gets metabolized. Now, you know, when activated charcoal became more of a thing, that's one of the reasons this fell out of favor because, you know, that's something that you can also do in addition to this once you finish the lavage, right? Yeah. So that was exactly kind of what we went through. What the book recommends and what our toxicologists recommend is 250 milliliter aliquots of room temperature saline. You're going to throw that down into the stomach, let it kind of switch around and then suck it back out. And you keep doing that until what you're pulling out is basically clear. It basically looks like what you put in in the first place. And like you said, hoping to recover some pill fragments, which is exactly what we got. We started doing this and we did get some pill fragments out. And I definitely remember a time where I worked where there were tox fellows kind of just right across the street where they would come over and they would sift through everything we were pulling out and try to count the tabs and figure out how much. And I'm like, I'm not doing that, guys. Just so everyone's clear, I'm not sifting through what we pull out of the stomach. We're just going to cross our fingers and hope that we get enough out to maybe reduce the level of toxicity. So we did that. And it was about two liters or so before we started getting clear stuff out. And at that point, we're like, we're done. That's all we can do. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not a fun procedure. This actually is something, you know, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this have never done one. So you should remember this because when it does come time, it's not it isn't that hard to do. It's the decision to do it like a lot of these high, you know, high acuity, low occurrence situations. And it's some know how and what your resources should be. So this sounds awesome. You got pill fragments. I want to know what happens yeah. next. Yeah. So we got some pill fragments. Like you said, we put some charcoal down into that tube. That was what was recommended by the toxicologist. Kind of makes sense. You might as well try and absorb as much as you can. We initially talked to our intensivist about bringing this patient in. But then after talking to the toxicologist, they're like, you know what? You guys don't necessarily have ECMO there. You're going to have to transfer this patient because many of these patients end up doing pretty poorly vasoactive support doesn't work, and they do go on to runs of ECMO. So we talked with our ECMO receiving center. They said, yep, send them over. It was actually one of the easier conversations I've ever had. Always helps to have a toxicologist involved in the conversation when you're calling for a transfer like this. And so we ended up transferring the patient out to get ECMO at the other center. Well, that sounds pretty fortunate. I'm sure a lot of people don't have that particular type of receiving center. That's not that common. So you may be stuck with admitting this patient to the ICU and hoping for the best. Multi-organ system failure is where you're going with this case. And yep. like you said, pressors, et cetera, aren't going to help. So, you know, you have to just hope for the best. Yeah, and that's what happened. I mean, we did start some pressors before we transferred the patient, just kind of to make sure that we kept a nice map. The patient did kind of have a little bit of a decline on arrival to the receiving center, was crashed onto ECMO. Had a run of ECMO that lasted about six or seven days, but actually did fairly well. Uh, the patient did need short time. The patient did need short term dialysis because they had some renal injury, they had a liver injury, they had lots of problems. And so, even though the ECMO run was only six or seven days, the ICU run was considerably longer. But the patient did have a relatively good outcome, which I think in these kind of situations it's tough because you look at this patient walking in, looking great, stable vital signs. And then walks out six, seven months later, not nearly as good as they walked in, but in a colchicine overdose, this level yeah. of a colchicine overdose, that's a pretty good outcome. I love that you're starting 2025 off with a save, man. That's good <laughs> stuff right there. It was, I'm, I'm just hoping that I don't run into this situation again, because Jen, I've had like two colchicine overdoses. Neither one went well, although I think, again, this is about as good as it gets. Both of them needed to have lavage. I'm kind of done. I'm done with lavage and I'm done with colchicine. <laughs> you found respect yeah. for the drug, Jan. You found respect. Yeah. You probably won't see another one of these. I mean, this is not that common. As you said, this is, it's an unusual overdose. I wish I could interview that patient later and ask them why they chose this particular medication if he had done some research and knew how toxic it was when, yeah, you know. I, I, I hope it was random. I hope it was just kind of what they fell into right. and it just, it ended up being it ended up being the choice out of the medicine cabinet that you really don't want, but 
Fortunately, because of our team and our toxicologist, I think we did the best we possibly could given the resources that we had. And it kind of left me with a couple of things just to remember. Now, gastric lavage, like you said, rare, maybe a couple of times in your career at most, but it can be life-saving if you have the right circumstance. And you're looking for that drug that has a severe toxicity, that you have a dose that can cause that toxicity, there's no antidote, and it was a recent ingestion. There actually might be pills in the stomach that you can get out. If you have all of that situation, then you should press on with this procedure, which of course, Jan, means that everybody needs to know where their lavage tube is. This was a, a little bit of an eye-opener for me. I didn't know where it was, but there is always that one person, that one tech or that one nurse in the hospital is like, oh yeah, I know where it is. I'll go get it. And that's exactly what I had. So I was very fortunate to have the person who knew where it was, found it, kind of blew the dust off the top, and then we actually used it. So Swami, can you tell me a little more about the decision-making around the transfer? Because obviously you have this very sick person. You're going to be transferring them to an ECMO center. I don't know how far away that center was for you, but is there too far? Is it too much? At what point would you draw a line? Did the toxicologist have any input on that particular decision? Yeah, that's a really good question. We, we didn't ask that at the time because my transfer center is pretty close. It was going to be a 15, 20 minute at most ambulance ride. So it really made sense. But that is part of the math. If you're working somewhere more remote, are you going to send this patient on a three, four, five hour ambulance ride or get a fixed wing to do this? I think if we had better data telling us that ECMO was clearly going to be a win for these patients, then I would say you're going to do it no matter what the transfer length is. And you're going to prepare your transfer team to understand that this patient is probably going to decompensate en route uh, on the other side of it. But of course, we don't really have that data. We don't know that ECMO is going to be the life save. And if you asked a bunch of toxicologists, my guess is half of them would say, sure, I'd go for it. And half of them would say, I don't know. And I, I think the I don't know is, is probably the most honest answer. We don't really know. But that was what was recommended. We had a short transfer time. It made a ton of sense for us. Yeah, as long as you have access to some kind of critical care transport, you know, they're, they're going intubated, you know, send them with some pressors. It's all supportive care anyway. You know, that's their best chance of survival. I mean, without it, you know, you may be looking at almost certain deaths. So it seems to me that's probably worth taking the chance. But I'm, that, that is an interesting question about how far is too far. All right, Jan. Well, great to have the save to start the year. A wonderful case, lots of stuff that we had to do, and we have some great pieces for the rest of the week. Our first one is sitting down with Darakast and talking about ectopic pregnancy, updating all of us on that management. 